All right, hello everyone, and welcome to But My House Isn't Historic. Many homeowners, many homeowners don't realize that once a property reaches the 50 year mark, it could be historically or architecturally significant. Buildings created in 1971 or before may be eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. Today, our panel shares how to acknowledge, landmark, and protect mid-century modern design, including one preservationist who makes her home in a 1951 executive ranch in the suburbs. I'm George Smart, Executive Director of USModernist.org and host of US Modernist Radio. It is my honor today to moderate this panel of distinguished preservation professionals. And joining me today are Rachel Robinson and Mary Kate Harrington. Of course, we couldn't do this without technical maestro Liz Rochefort, who will keep our presentation gears turning this morning. Please notify Liz through the chat box of any technical issues that you experience during the presentation. And for questions, please put those in the question box, the QA box, instead of chat, and that will help us facilitate things when we move on later. All right, everybody ready? Nod, please, everyone nod. Nodding, okay, nodding good. All right, just a moment. Rachel Robinson is Director of Preservation for the Providence Preservation Society. She is the former Executive Director of the View Carre Foundation and Felicity Redevelopment in New Orleans. Rachel holds a master's degree in urban and environmental planning and a certificate in historic preservation from the University of Virginia. And she has a master's degree in historic and sustainable architecture from New York University, London. I didn't even know they had a campus there. Uh, she serves on the board of the West Broadway Neighborhood Association and the New England Chapter Society of His Ar Architectural Historians. And she's a member of the Providence Community Library Facilities Committee. She's a member of a lot of things. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you, George, and hello, everyone. Uh, my slides are loading, so they'll hopefully be here in just a moment. But I just wanted to thank George for his wonderful keynote address this morning. That was really interesting. This idea for uh, for this session to Sarah Zurier in the before times, um, because I was becoming more and more aware of homeowners who didn't realize that their, or think about their homes as being historic. Uh, uh, but of course, now that we have the 20th century uh, in the rear view mirror, we can think more holistically about all the types of architecture uh, that uh, came on board in the 20th century. And it's not just the Art Deco and uh, Bauhaus and, and great early modernism, uh, the international style, but we can begin uh, to slowly creep into uh, uh, more domestic styles and more um, widespread styles, looking at the ranch maybe with new, um, with new eyes. And sorry for the delay. Uh, so if you'll advance to the next si slide, please. These were two friends of mine in Providence who told me, me, a professional preservationist and architectural historian, to my face, uh, but Rachel, my house isn't historic. And I thought, hmm, why, why do you think that? Because it's not made out of wood, because it's not Victorian, because it isn't quote unquote colonial. Um, why do you think your house isn't historic? Judged on uh, age alone, next slide, uh, do you realize that your house is nearly a century old? Uh, so by that marker alone, let's begin to think of these two houses, which are clearly uh, historic and architecturally significant in their own ways. Um, let's begin to think of them in new light. So friends, next slide. I hate to tell you that if your house is 90 years old, it might be historic. So I pitched this idea to Sarah uh, to see if we could begin to open our minds to uh, younger architecture that is now reaching that 50 years of eligibility, as George said previously, uh, and how some of our preservation tools uh, of protection and recognition can be applied to younger residential American architecture. Uh, so I've divided this talk into two parts. The first half, we're gonna look at um, early a snapshot of preservation, the preservation movement in the US. And then we'll look at some examples that I'm talking about of these younger eligible uh, buildings in Providence. Next slide. 
All right, so here's, I would say buckle our seat belts at this point, um, but we're in the 1960s, we're not using seat belts. Uh, so here regionally, we have, uh, this is all of course, happening in the 20th century after the establishment of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association uh, down in Virginia to save George Washington's uh, plantation. Uh, the early movement was largely uh, for posterity and uh, centered around early American history and our founding fathers, so not incredibly inclusive, but an important start. Here in the 20th century, we really get going with the professionalization uh, of the preservation movement in the US. So regionally, we have the very important Society for the Protection of New England Antiquities. That is a mouthful. Fortunately, today, they are the historic, we know them as Historic New England. Got an early start, uh, the first and largest regional uh, preservation nonprofit in the US. Very importantly, the first local historic district was established in 1931 in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, the second, six years later, in uh, the Vucre of, of New Orleans, the French Quarter. Uh, so those gave mun municipalities teeth, uh, legal purview, uh, and uh, regulatory authority to protect buildings by reviewing changes to the exterior of them. Uh, and, and applying zoning, which is, was in a very important marriage there. Uh, then in the 30s, we have um, FDR's attempt to put out of work architects to work, uh, documenting existing buildings of the uh, 18th and 19th century uh, across America. Uh, HABS, as we know it, uh, is still around and has a great, uh, is a great resource that you can now access through the Library of Congress website. Uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, uh, which is still really the mothership of nonprofit preservation and advocacy, uh, got started in 1949. And now we must take pause for a moment to think about the demolition of Penn Station, which happened in 1963. Uh, the first Penn Station was the slightly younger sister of our own Rhode Island State House. Uh, done by the same architects, McKim, Mead, and White. And when it was demolished uh, as a 53-year-old building, uh, it really uh, shocked a lot of New Yorkers and Americans. But that type of monumental loss does help galvanize the um, preservation at the federal level. So three years later, we get the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act, which sets up many things uh, chiefly the National Register of Historic Places. Next slide. And the 50-year rule, what does that mean? Well, uh, in most cases, it's not a hard and fast rule, and some would say it's flawed, but I think it's a useful tool that gives us about two generations worth of perspective to look back at styles, uh, historical context, and to consider buildings with fresh eyes. Uh, and so at this point, 50 years, we see eligibility for National Register listing or for a PPS historic marker uh, and many other things. So useful tool, but not hard and fast rule. And if we do some simple math, as has been pointed out uh, 50 years ago, we'd be looking at 1951, uh, 71, sorry. Next slide. All right, so here's our local snapshot of the preservation movement in Providence. Uh, 1956, the establishment of my own um, organization here, the Providence Preservation Society. We are a textbook early preservation nonprofit in so many ways. Our founders helped to establish Providence's own um, local historic district commission in 1960 uh, at the city of Providence. So giving teeth and regulatory purview uh, through zoning overlays. That happened in 1960. Unsurprisingly, the first local historic district in Providence was College Hill. Also in the early 60s, PPS established our historic, historic marker program uh, to identify and celebrate buildings, uh, early buildings on the landscape. Uh, and then our host today, the Rhode Island Historical Preservation and Heritage Commission, our SHPO, State Historic Preservation Office, was established in 1968 as a result of the National Historic Preservation Act. Uh, so in thinking about these 
the establishment of these agencies and organizations and programs. Let's recognize how much documentation was going on and survey work in the 1960s and as we're going to see also in the 1970s. Uh, as we say, we can't save it if we don't know where it is or what it is. So a lot of work's going on um, to document early uh, Providence and Rhode Island buildings. Next slide. Okay, so in the 70s, we really kick into gear. The National Register, as I've told you, was established in 1966. Uh, so by the 70s, uh, this must have been a hive of activity to uh, complete the nominations for these early residential historic districts on the National Register. Uh, again, starting, not surprisingly, with College Hill. And we'll see, you know, with this work being done in the 70s, the survey work, the documentation, the research, um, we see that our little building, one of my friend's houses, is included or was included uh, from the beginning in the Hope Street uh, National Register Historic District, uh, but marked as C for modern, not keeping up with the, not in keeping with the original character of the district. That's true but it now has its own history and um, additional 50 years worth of patina. And so we see a building like this in a much different light today, uh, which goes to show that we need to continue to revisit these nominations, this documentation, uh, and the scholarship uh, to include buildings that may have been overlooked because they were too young at the time uh, or not considered architecturally or historically significant. Now, one of the best examples I know of this um, from across the United States is right here in Rhode Island. Uh, our, the SHPO, uh, just a couple years ago, uh, provided additional documentation for the College Hill uh, Historic District on the National Register, not only revisiting some buildings that weren't included or looked at in 1970 or 76, but more importantly, uh, being more inclusive about the histories of the ever important African American and Cape Verdeans to the story of College Hill and Fox Point. So this work can be done, it continues, uh, and we should keep up with it. Next slide, please. Okay, the other thing that's going on during this period, as I know very well as a bicentennial baby, is the bicentennial fervor. So great interest in American history. Um, obviously, this is white Anglo-Saxon history, um, looking at the colonial and revolutionary history of our country. So not, not particularly inclusive, but it is going on in the background. And next slide. And also, I think it's important to look at the snapshot of population. Providence is not uh, unique in this at all. Um, most cities peaked in population in the 1940s during World War II as the GIs came back and the babies boomed, they moved into the suburbs where we'll see a lot of the growth in Rhode Island uh, outside of Providence during this period. Uh, it's also the rise of the personal automobile, uh, which helped the suburbs really thrive. Uh, but it's worth saying, too, that this is the period of uh, interstate construction, which ripped apart uh, inner city neighborhoods, also the period of redlining and urban renewal. Uh, but cities are on the rise again, and, and populations have been ticking up uh, over the last couple of decades. All right, next slide. Okay, so that, that's our history portion. Now we're going to uh, turn our minds more to architectural history so you understand what I'm thinking about and inviting you to consider with, uh, with fresh eyes. I took a look at some of the books I own uh, to see how um, authors framed this period of not just mid-century architecture that does get a lot of attention, uh, thanks to folks like George, uh, but really this postmodern, um, late modern uh, residential architecture. So Alan Powers, who was one of my professors in London, he framed it as beyond modern 1950 to 1996 in the elements of style. Then a book I'm sure many of you own, uh, The Field Guide to American Houses, uh, they framed this as American houses since 1940, um, pointing out modern, neo-eclectic, and contemporary folk styles uh, and types. And I draw your attention to the image in the bottom right. Um, we have the word contemporary and shed. Uh, so here's an example from another book. Um, and these building styles and types, I 
expect that many of you have seen before. Um, I think it's curious that they are labeled as a vacation house and seaside house uh, because I certainly know them in more residential um, applications. Uh, next slide, if we can. There we go. Okay. So let's actually take a look at some of this architecture in Providence. And I'm calling this the Generation X architecture. I am a member of Generation X. And so in human terms, uh, that is people born between 1965 and 1980. And I think it nicely captures this, you know, 15 year period where these buildings are just becoming eligible for recognition and certain protections. And so, you know, like I said, let, I invite you to look at them in new light. They might even be older than you imagined, um, but certainly have, you know, are of their period and worth a second glance. Uh, so this is Mishasek Square Apartments on uh, straddling the river on Charles and North Main Streets in Providence. I'm sure you've passed it a million times driving up to Whole Foods. You can see our the dome of our state house in the background. Uh, but stylistically, very interesting, I think, um, with brick and concrete. Next slide. Uh, here is a uh, maybe less admired example, but I think these are um, pretty smart um, looking buildings on South Main Street from 1974. Uh, Again, I think these are, are nice looking. I just hate to think of what was there um, before these were built on South Main. Next. Rachel, I'm sorry to interrupt you again. Some of our attendees are only seeing my desktop and it appears that some are seeing the presentation. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what to do here. Um, I'm wondering. Okay. Should we try to reload it? I'm afraid to do that, <laughs> but let me let me give it a shot. Okay, I'm trying to reload it. Um, just give me just a moment, everyone. Thank you. And while we wait, we'll just have a word from our sponsor, PowerPoint. <laughs> a lovely technical device that makes us all happy. Thank you, Microsoft, <laughs> for this delicious product that we've all become dependent on. I'm so sorry, everyone. Let me try to go back into sharing my full screen, which means I'm going to lose access to the chat. So please just tell me, uh, Rachel, verbally if this works. Can do. We have the We've title. Got the cover. Page. Yep. Right, is this where you were, Rachel? That's the title page. So we want to go towards the second half. Okay, so I'm having a discrepancy again here. Um, Okay, so give us just one moment. I apologize, everyone. This is taking a long time for us to load. While we wait, I've phoned Rachel's physician to order some Valium for her, because I know she's freaking out over there <laughs> right now. The the CVS will be delivering at any moment, Rachel. Thank you, George. We're, we're okay. You know, after a year of doing this virtually, you just got to be um, <laughs> ready for the unexpected. Isn't Rhode Island famous for having CVS? Isn't that the headquarters? We are we are the the world headquarters up in Woonsocket in the north part of the state. Yeah. I get a lot of email from Woonsocket. <laughs> well, when you get those long receipts with coupons, you can think of us, George. Okay. Okay, Rachel, right. are you do you see it now? Yes, it is not full screen yet, um, but you are on a slide you can go with. Perfect. If you all in the audience will let, uh, let us know through the chat, if you're unable to see uh, the slide, you should be seeing Generation X architecture in Providence, uh, the garden house on Congdon Street. 
Uh, so I'll pick up here. Uh, this is perhaps one of our best known modern buildings, houses in Providence, if you do know of it. Uh, it's pretty demure from the, from the street, um, but looks out west uh, towards the State House and across Providence, and, and one can only imagine the views. Um, I don't know what was in the water on the northwestern slope of College Hill, but, but like pockets of, New, of uh, North Carolina that George introduced us to, you know, there was some very eclectic and adventurous architecture. Uh, so this house dates to 1974. Uh, the next slide, please. Another uh, single family residence, uh, this by Bill Warner, 1974, up on Prospect Street. Again, this is the east street side, um, but with great views on the west. Next slide. Uh, here are some townhouses, I guess you would say, a row of um, coupled residences uh, from 1975 on Pratt Street. So again, great views across the city. Next slide. And uh, these are across the ones, Mashasic uh, apartments that we saw uh, at the beginning. And these might be older than, than you thought, 1975, signed by Michael Hotel. Um, but I think they're interesting in their own right. I'm not sure I would want to live on that busy street, um, but some interesting architecture. Next slide. And this curious, curious fellow here, um, townhouses. Uh, this is located, I'm sure you've walked past them or driven past them many times. They're located with the gable end on Washington Street uh, between the Providence Public Library and Cathedral Square. Uh, and I, I think they're curious. It reminds me a little bit of things I've seen in places like Old Town Alexandria. Uh, I just think it's kind of a bonkers idea to have a stoop uh, at being so exposed to this urban area on a main street. Um, but coincidentally, these came before the Downtown Design Review Committee uh, last week. So there may be some changes in their future. And next slide, we see. All right, so what is PPS doing to celebrate these buildings uh, and to acknowledge some early residential architecture in Providence, early modern? Um, so we have our historic marker program, which I've told you about. Uh, and these are not the most recent markers that have been awarded, uh, but the youngest buildings uh, within our marker library. Uh, you may recognize and learn more about the Ira Ratkintansky family home in the bottom right. Next slide. We also have digitized our Guide to Providence Architecture, the book we did about 20 years ago uh, with the AIA Rhode Island. And this is an opportunity to uh, use the search function if you want to find a particular architect or style or location, but it's also organized by tours. And so the City Reinvents Itself tour will uh, introduce you to even more architecture from this period, both civic and private. Next slide. Uh, and finally, I wanted to introduce the idea of social media. This is something PPS uses. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, but last year at our fall symposium, we had uh, Gerald um, Cooper uh, from Hood Mid-Century Modern uh, speak, to, uh, speak at our symposium. And so he's done great things. He has nearly as many uh, followers as the National Trust, um, but it, introducing mid-century architecture uh, to newer and wider audiences. Cheap Old Houses is another great site. Um, introducing millennials, I think, to architecture, residential architecture of all styles and periods throughout the United States. And with that, I think we've made it to the end. Um, next slide. This is the house, circa 1984, that I grew up in. It was not a beach house uh, or a seaside house, but a mountain house um, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. That my parents built. So thank you, George. I apologize that we've had some technical problems, um, but I'm so pleased to be with all of you today. Thank you, Rachel. You did a great job under duress. Applause all around. Our next speaker is Mary Kate Harrington. She is Public Information Manager at Rhode Island Housing. She has a bachelor's degree in historic preservation from Roger Williams University and previously worked as Director of Preservation Services at the Providence Preservation Society, as well as being the architectural historian 
for Public Archaeology Laboratory, a cultural resources management firm. Since 2013, Mary Kate and her family have happily lived in a 1951 architect design, mid-century modern in Smithfield, Rhode Island. She serves on the board of the Smithfield Historic Preservation Commission. Welcome, Mary Kate. Thank you, George. Thank you, everyone. So to add to the tech challenges today, um, during Rachel's presentation, I decided to uh, play around with my laptop uh, to get some better lighting. And um, now I can't get the screen on my laptop, so I no longer have a camera um, because I'm using my PC screen. Um, but I am still here, um, and so you'll just hear my voice for this uh, right now. Um, so really, I'm here this morning to talk about something that I love, which is mid-century modern architecture but more specifically, the home I get to live in out in the suburbs of Smithfield. People ask me why I love mid-century modern architecture and design. And for me, I have to say it's part professional and part personal. While I have both a degree and professional background in preservation, I love the history and design aesthetic of mid-century modern architecture. But I have to admit and be honest that my true love comes from a nostalgia from growing up. When I grew up in the late 70s and 80s, my parents were older when they got married, so I was very much influenced by their likes and interests. I was surrounded by mid-century modern from watching mid-century movies, TV shows, art, and listening to period music. In fact, I would have to say my pop cultural references are not from the 70s or 80s, rather the 1950s and early 1960s. I'm more likely to know something about actresses like David Niven, Doris Day, Rock Hudson, and Patty Duke than say, Michael J. Fox or Don Johnson. So here I've included a couple screenshots from two of my favorite period movies that have fantastic mid-century modern interiors, North by Northwest and Pillow Talk. After living in a 1940s, what I would say leave it to Beaver, colonial revival style Kate, my husband and I were fortunate enough to realize a dream when we found our current home on Zillow and it was love at first sight. Our 1950s executive ranch features many of the hallmarks of the mid-century modern style. You can see here from the photos of the exterior, we've got some strong horizontal and linear forms, a nice juxtaposition of different and sometimes contrasting materials. On our home, it's the wood shingles with a stone veneer. We have very, very wide overhanging eaves, expansive panes of glass, which allow light to enter and provide some great scenic views to our surrounding neighborhood. And as you can see from the photos, our home features very large windows with a combination of casement, stationary, and awning styles. Another hallmark of this style that we love is its integration with nature. We've got a lot of landscaping elements, stone stairs, pathways, and both front and rear stone patios. And the use of veneer stone on the exterior can also be found on the interior of the home. I've pulled this page from a resource that I found online titled The Guide to Maintaining Your Mid-Century Modern Home, and it's from an organization in Cleveland. At the end of my chat, I'll put a few links um, to this report and a few others that you might be interested in seeing. I appreciate the level of detail that this report spends and goes into on the ranch house type, which was heavily influenced by the designs of Frank Lloyd Wright, whose, include, whose work included many hallmarks of the ranch style, open living spaces, low horizontal massing, and an openness to nature. Developers and architects of the period sought to promote a casual, family-oriented and open home that was connected to the landscape around it. Article, articles in Architectural Digests and other design magazines brought regional and national exposure to ranch house designs during the 1930s and later. While some of the design elements of ranch homes may change based on location and period of construction, many ranches were generally one room deep, have a low roof and deep eaves, and appear unassuming from the street but often include rooms looking out onto backyard courtyards and patios. Nationally, the ranch house became the central building type of suburban tract house developments because of its affordability and flexibility. I apologize, my mouse keeps delaying my advancement of slides. The clean lines of the mid-century modern aesthetic fortunately continue over into our home's interior. As we have a large open floor plan, large windows bringing the outside in, simple and clean lines throughout, and that same stone found on the exterior is found on our fireplace, entryway, and in our den. I'm gonna share a few photos with you that we took when first touring our home to give you a sense of how it looked and what appealed to us. 
although some of the original features have been hidden beneath deep shag carpeting found throughout most of the house and a few unfortunate remodels, there was still a lot of mid-century modern to love. Fortunately, we have original bathrooms, a basement with a bar, stone fireplace, built-in shelving, and a sunken living room. There's just something about a vintage bathroom, like our main bathroom here, that draws me in. As you can see, it features all original tile and fixtures, and the etched glass swan door is a personal favorite of ours. To date, our only true improvements to this room have been a fresh coat of paint. Our pink half bath also retains all of its original tiles, fixtures, shelving, and mirror. And the basement bathroom that you see on the right, while very small in size, packs a powerful punch with its original tiling, wallpaper, and shower door with an etched marlin. When considering the home and since first living here, we've had a lot of friends and family and neighbors come by and ask when we might be planning to upgrade and redo these bathrooms. We often look at them in shock before we invite them to leave because bathroom remodels are just not going to be in our plans. We're also very fortunate to have a remarkably preserved uh, basement. With original flooring, wood paneled walls, an expansive bar, and walk out to the backyard, these are just a few of the things that we love. The basement also includes a kitchen laundry room and one of my favorite features. The telephone shelf you can see in the lower right hand side of your screen. While we no longer even have a landline at our house, it's one of my favorite features because it reminds me of how people used to live and communicate. And a fun aspect to the history of our home is that the family who resided here included a father who was a surgeon and a stay-at-home mom with five children. In the summer months, the family spent most of their time in the basement, which is much cooler than the main floor and offers easy access to the rear yard. So much time, in fact, the house includes two doorbells, one labeled the summer bell, which rings down in the basement so the family can hear their guests. While overall a house was in very good condition, you will hear many people say, the biggest enemy of a modern house is deferred maintenance, and this can sometimes be true. While many mid-century homes may have passed on to second and third owners who have done total remodels, in many cases, you can still be fortunate to find homes that have remained in the hands of their original owners and are largely unchanged. The positive is you will retain many original features. A slight downside may be that the house could be in poor condition due to deferred maintenance. And shots of the exterior of our home show a fairly heavily treed property, a roof in need of repair, and stone terracing that we've since worked to keep clean, clean and free of debris. It's amazing what a little water and a bristle brush can do to remove years of built up debris and really let this natural stonework shine through. Excuse me as shown in the photo on the top upper right. One important thing to consider when purchasing a ranch house, a ranch house though, is that they are mostly all roof. So the cost of a roof replacement can be extensive. In fact, while we've lived here for a number of years, we only just had the roof replaced this past winter. A few other things to consider for a mid-century home could be things like the asbestos tiling that we find in our basement. We're very, very fortunate that the tiling was kept in great condition and therefore we have not needed to remove it. But if it was cracked or chipped, uh, these asbestos tiles could create hazards and would need to be removed by professionals and with caution. While the popularity of the style has hit an all time high, another thing that can be difficult is finding tradespeople that are fluent and experienced in restoration and repair, and that don't automatically suggest remodeling it in a way that would wipe away many of the mid century modern features. And while our windows are in good condition, keeping such large panes of glass <laughs> takes a lot of effort with young children running around the house. Before I show you some of the updates we've made, I wanted to share a little bit about the history of our home in the neighborhood. Our house, like several others on our street, was built by a local developer, Peter Capalbo. Peter built our home for his son, Carmine, who graduated from Brown University and was a surgeon at Rhode Island Hospital. Dr. Capalbo lived here with his wife and their five children prior to selling it to us, and we consider ourselves very lucky to be only the second owners of the house. We also feel very fortunate that he left us the architect's original plans. Plans are great to have for a number of reasons because they detail a few things like the original kitchen, which was later remodeled and lost all of its 1950s charm. We plan to use these plans as we embark on our kitchen remodel sometime later this year. The plans have also helped us find out a little bit more about the architects themselves. The architects for our home was the firm of Washburn and Luther, which included Harold E. Washburn of Attleboro and C. Warren Luther of Pawtucket. 
The firm designed many residences and buildings in and around the Attleboro area, including the synagogue you see on the left side of your screen, the Murray Unitarian Church, the Mansfield Town Hall and Police Station, and Attleboro's Burrow Studley School. They also designed middle schools in Rehoboth and Fall River, office buildings in Hartford, Connecticut, Rochester, New York, and even Newport, Rhode Island. A graduate of Rhode Island School of Design, just two years after designing our home, Washburn was hired by RISD to serve on their faculty in the Division of Architecture, and he continued teaching there until 1989 when he retired as Professor Emeritus. Luther was first educated at Wentworth in Boston before transferring to RISD. He graduated in 1948 with degrees in Industrial Arts Education and Architecture, and also taught at RISD from 1950 to 1990. I actually had a great discovery recently in doing a little more research. I found a podcast on RISD's site um, and they are actually interviewing uh, Luther. Um, and he talks about his experience at RISD and being uh, the first student to get dual degrees in industrial arts education and architecture. Both Luther and Washburn worked up until their respective retirements in 1991 and 97. Really exciting to see that our home was one of the first residential designs after graduating school. And it's been interesting to be able to learn more about the architects and see examples of their mid-century design in their institutional, religious, and educational work. Now I'm gonna take you for a walk around our neighborhood. Just so you don't think that our home is unusual for the street, I'll give you a quick tour of some of the other mid-century modern and interesting homes you, you'll, you can find. Like many residential neighborhoods laid out in this period, ours is a compact walkable neighborhood built close to schools, shopping, libraries, and local businesses. The house you're seeing here one of the favorites on our street. Um, while I love mine, I'm going to admit that if this house was ever on the market, I would probably flip very quickly. Um, it's strong horizontal lines and the use of wood cladding and exterior stonework are just um, quite intriguing. A few more homes built slightly later than ours feature walls of glass. And again, those wide overhanging eaves and a really nice integration with nature. We actually have a few houses on our street that are very similar to ours in size, layout, and design elements. If you look at the photo on the left, you'll see that it's one of two houses that look very similar to ours on the street. And then we have what's known in our neighborhood as the castle. It was built a couple decades after ours, uh, but we love it. It really adds to the architectural vibrancy and uniqueness our street is known for. Now back to some of the improvements we've made on the inside of the house. Uh, here's our dining room. Like most of the house, when we purchased it, it was covered in heavy carpeting. Um, most of the rooms had shag carpeting. Uh, the dining room had just a thick, plush, pink carpet. Um, we laugh when we recall how the house looked when we first purchased it because both the kitchen, the mudroom, and even the kitchen cabinets um, were covered in carpeting. Uh, we like to say that someone came through our street uh, probably in the maybe 1980s, early 90s, and made a killing. Um, in installing carpeting all throughout. Uh, since that time, we've installed engineered hardwood flooring in the dining room, which was one of the only rooms that didn't have original hardwood flooring. We painted the walls and we've added a lot of furnishing and elements that reflect the home's 1950s design aesthetic. One of the great things about owning mid-century home now is the availability of period pieces that you can find, I would say quite easily. Uh, we do a lot of shopping on Facebook Marketplace, eBay, Etsy, we're very lucky that just over the state line, Putnam, Connecticut has a number of antique shops that specialize in mid-century modern. We were fortunate to be able to also get some pieces of furniture from the previous owner that I think if we had not uh, rescued, probably would have ended up in the dumpster somewhere. Um, we've also found a few things like our dining room table shown here and our cabinet in the lower right-hand corner, um, just off Facebook Marketplace. Um, in fact, one of them we were given for free. So there's a lot of resources out there and I think we're very lucky to find these. Um, other rooms like the bedrooms require minimal work because it was really just a fresh coat of paint, pulling off uh, lots of shag carpeting, pulling up a lot of staples that were nailing that uh, shag carpeting down. Um, and we were very lucky. I think they had the shag carpeting up for such a long period of time that the floors were very well preserved and we just had them refinished and I think they look great today. One of the first things we did do though was decide to paint the exterior of the house. As previously painted, everything including the trim was painted the same sort of tan color that you see here in the upper right. Um, there was very little visual contrast between the stonework and the wood shingles. A quick drive by, it just looked like 
all one solid block and mass. Um, some of the things that we did were just using quick, simple Photoshop tools on our phones, and we played around with a number of, of color palettes before choosing what you see in the lower right-hand corner, which is what I call just a medium-toned blue with white trim and red for the garage door. Uh, living on a street with many trees, shrubs, lots and lots of foliage, it has really helped our home to pop, I would say, which has been great to us. Um, before we moved in, there were a lot of people that thought we were sort of crazy to buy a house. They thought that it was in a much worse condition um, than it truly was. I think just because it didn't stand out, um, there was a lot of uh, tree cover coverings, um, a lot of trees and branches even were on the roof of the house. Um, so just some of the elbow grease that we put into it, uh, we get a lot of people driving by now or stopping by to visit saying, um, you know, they wish they had wish they had purchased it when it was on the market. Um, overall, we've tried to maintain the design and aesthetic of our house, making improvements to bring it back to its former glory and highlight all these mid-century modern elements that we love. Um, we look at our time here as being stewards of the home. So if we can bring something back to its glory, if we can really work hard to preserve what we have and the fabric that we've been given, um, that's really one of our goals. Um, the majority of our efforts to date have been to remove the later renovations, which included the shag carpeting that I mentioned. We had a few rooms that had sort of faux wood paneling installed in the late 70s and 80s. And then again, just really maintenance and repair as needed. Um, some of the really big deferred maintenance issues we did have to deal with though, um, and the biggest and most expensive was that replacement of the roof. Um, again, being a ranch, our house is just 100% roof. Um, so we did take a little while before we had that project done. And another thing we found out very early on was that there was very little insulation in the home. We purchased it in the winter and um, there was snow on the ground, but no snow on that roof because uh, the heat from inside was, I think, basically just heating the roof and the air above it. Um, but these wide eaves that you see in these photos, they're remarkably good condition. And we really haven't experienced any water infiltration. And overall, I would say the house was solidly, solidly built and hopefully can live on for many more decades. Um, let's see, some of our future projects that we're thinking about doing is again, bringing the kitchen back to its former glory, using those plans, um, and then lots of landscaping improvements. We do live on a relatively large lot at the rear of the house, um, and we just haven't gotten around to all of the projects that we might have planned originally. I was commenting to the presenters as we were uh, waiting to start this morning and saying that uh, while we do truly love this open layout and it works for our family's lifestyle, um, one of the difficulties I found today is my children are both on school vacation and with an open layout, I'm currently parked in our dining room and there are no doors I can close. Um, so they have been banished to the uh, bedrooms for this time. Um, but again, I do love the openness. I think while we've had to hunker down for the pandemic, we've just again fallen in love with our house all over. Um, it all has a lot of features that we love that we think are both beautiful and aesthetic, but really functional. Um, the wide overhanging eaves that I showed you, they offer a really good airflow with our, they protect the house, they keep it cool, we have good airflow from the windows. So our house really stays cool even in the hottest of summers. Um, but for those few weeks when it does get really, really hot, we head down to the full basement, which stays cool on even, even the hottest of days, um, which has been really great for us. We don't have central air and we have not wanted to install uh, AC units because we don't have any double hung windows. Um, they are all either stationary, casement, or awning, um, and we really don't like the options there for uh, window units. Uh, we have radiant heat throughout the house, so it keeps the rooms really nicely evenly heated. Um, another thing I like about the ranch homes from this period is they're kind of block form and layout. Um, it's, it's easy to add and subtract, if you will. So at one point, the previous owners, when they had a son, they needed to add another bedroom and they added it onto the house and it just looks really great. It, the flow has not been interrupted. Uh, it's a smart design that continues through to today. Don't here on this slide are just some of the stonework on both the exterior and interior of the house, which we love. I don't know if you can see it, but on the right hand side, you can see these small projecting um, pieces of stone and we use them to display photographs, um, other sort of mid-century knickknacks that we like. Uh, the photo on the lower left hand corner that's actually the stonework on the floor of our entryway um, one design feature that we do see in the plans is an internal planter a raised planter our neighbors across the street still have theirs ours at one point 
was removed um, and covered over. But maybe someday we'll bring that back as well. As I mentioned, we feel very fortunate to have found the house, but we're also happy to be living in a time when the style of architecture and design are very popular. So in the years we've been living here, uh, we've been able to find a lot of invaluable resources to source materials, to gain knowledge and information. Two of my favorite websites are Atomic Ranch and Retro Renovation. I'll put the links there in the chat. Um, and there's a whole world out there of mid-century modern enthusiasts, really a lot that even include, um, you know, real focus on ranch homes. Having that pink bathroom I showed you a few minutes ago means I'm also a fan of any entity that wants to raise awareness of and provide resources for maintaining and preserving the bathrooms. So one of my favorite websites is savethepinkbathrooms.com. Um, other sources for decor and furnishings that we found, Habitat for Humanities Restore Shop, Goodwill and Savers have a lot of items, um, estate sales, Facebook Marketplace, and a lot of Facebook groups that have mid-century modern furnishers, furnishings and design. Um, and then, of course, there's always Instagram and Pinterest for design inspiration. I don't think um, any of you, you know, you could probably spend an hour just doing some quick Googling and you'll find a lot of things that could head you down that rabbit hole um, of mid-century modern. Um, I know many of us may not have the financial resources or time to source original furnishings. So another thing that's great about being alive and living in a mid-century home today is there's a lot of new design and furnishings that have that same aesthetic. Um, some of our favorites are West Elm all modern and even Ikea. And then also due to its popularity, we're starting to see modern, um, mid-century modern uh, materials being uh, replicated and duplicated and sold at national hardware chain stores. I was looking online at Home Depot for a friend and they even have a line of mid-century modern replacement doors. Uh, many Instagram and Facebook groups that I love are shown here on this screen. My favorite is mid-century modern kitsch. Um, I do fall more on the kitschy side of things, and I'll own that. I love Atomic Living. Um, there's a Facebook group that's great for just mid-century ranch homes. And then there's a few just focused on kitchens and even modern re repair and restoration, which are great resources where others are out there, you know, blazing a path that you can just follow. Um, of course, one of my favorite websites and Facebook pages is usmodernist.org because it's done a lot to document and promote mid-century modern residential architecture. I'm going to wrap up with my last slide um, and just remind us all you know, how much fun mid-century can be. Um, and, you know, there's still a lot of interest out there, um, as shown by recent TV shows and movies that are either set in the 1950s and early 60s or in the present day. And they're, they include a nice nod to the mid-century. So I've done a couple of screen grabs from the TV show Mad Men and also one of my personal favorites, uh, the Pixar cartoon, The Incredibles. Um, for these, me, these movies and shows offer a chance to be inspired even more. And then two recent articles that I found, one in Rhode Island Monthly that showcased a number of mid-century modern homes, and then one just from about a month ago in Providence Business News, highlighting the sale of a mid-century home in Providence for $1.3 million. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of interest. Um, I want to thank you all for listening to me today and allowing me to show you something that I care and love um, so much. I think it's a really exciting time for preservationists to be examining mid-century architecture. My home will be celebrating 70 years next year, and I'm proud to say that our town's Historic Preservation Commission is currently examining and beginning to document our mid-century resources. Thanks so much. Mary Kate, thank you. I I'm so jealous of your basement. I mean, I wanna know when the next party is. It could there be like a tiki night? Looks like it would be uh, great for that in any era. I feel like post pandemic, there's a lot of opportunities for people to get together, come sit poolside and uh, come into the bar and have a few drinks. Well, thank you again. That was a great presentation. All right, we have time for a, a few questions before the end of our session today. Um, I'll go to the first one. This is from Megan. I think this is for Rachel. Uh, would you repeat the name of the book highlighted early on reviewing the anatomy of a ranch house? Yeah, I wondered if that was for me or if Mary Kate had also um, uh, shown a book. I'm using the books, by the way, to hold up my computer, as we do. Um, this one is the Visual Dictionary of American Domestic Architecture. It has some really nice drawings, um, which can be useful, I very useful, uh, in addition to photographs, because it kind of trains your eyes um, to look at the real character defining features. But I find books on architecture all the time at thrift stores and book sales. 
Uh, and so you can build your own library, resource library. All right, uh, George, I'll direct this next. Go ahead. I'm Mary sorry, Kay. George, I'm currently pasting a few links into the uh, chat session. Um, and if people were interested, there was a maintaining your mid-century modern uh, guide that I'd found online that came out of Cleveland. So I did post that link there. Good, thank you. I'll give this next question uh, to Mary Kate. Uh, within a National Register Historic District, what do you do about newer houses that fall outside the period of significance? Oh, goodness. Um, so while I have a background in preservation, I'm not currently working in preservation. So I haven't done a National Register nomination in probably about, you know, 13 years or so. Um, so I'm not sure about that, Rachel. What do you think? I, I think it's definitely time we start challenging the 50 year rule. Um, conversations are coming up in architectural history and preservation circles about the vulnerability of buildings like POMO, postmodern. Um, and, you know, if those are younger buildings, uh, what can we do now to try to save and celebrate them? And so I, I'm not a rebel, but sometimes I like to think I'm a rebel. And I think we should challenge this 50 year rule. Um, if somebody wants to make the case at, for a PPS historic marker and it's younger than 50 years, you know, make your argument. Let's let's see if we can find significance that is not closely tied to age. And just and to chime in there question. too. Go ahead. Sorry, George, I just want to chime in. I mentioned that even in our sleepy little town of Smithfield, uh, the Preservation Commission is looking at starting to document mid-century modern homes. And I think that's a really important first step. Um, through that documentation, hopefully we can raise awareness and an appreciation of these uh, homes from the period. Here's a related question from Kay. Do you think that 1970s and 80s houses and other buildings from that era are particularly vulnerable to the loss of integrity through updates due to the lack of appreciation for the original styles? 100%. Um, and I listen, I understand we want to update our particularly bathrooms and kitchens um, so that they are comfortable and convenient.